Well, welcome to this next session of New Covenant Theology. We're going to be talking about boundary markers in this session and the next. So this session is going to focus on Old Covenant boundary markers. Now, when we say boundary marker, what, is, what does that mean? What is a covenant boundary marker or just a boundary marker in general? Well, it's, it's essentially a certain unique ritual, set of rituals or uh, clothing or behaviors or characteristics that will identify an individual as belonging to a group. We can take a, an analogy uh, in the sense of we don't call them boundary markers, but you can think of uniforms as a type of boundary marker, meaning that when the people are wearing this uniform, it indicates that they belong to a particular group, or we could say a, a team. And so in athletics, you'll have each team wearing distinct clothing and colors and things like that to identify them as being part of their own groups so that you don't mix up players on the field. And so the Old Covenant has boundary markers like this. Israel had a certain way of life. Uh, they had a certain culture, they had certain religious activities that they did, and these designated a person as belonging to their covenant community, hence boundary markers, that there's a boundary that defines who the community, who's in the community. And there are three major boundary markers in the Old Covenant. These are the Sabbath, food laws, and circumcision. Let's talk about circumcision first. Circumcision as a boundary marker. Well, actually, circumcision predates the Old Covenant. Circumcision was first given to Abraham in the Abrahamic Covenant. Here's what we read in Genesis chapter 17. It says, And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant. You and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So when God makes this covenant with Abraham, he gives him this regulation to keep as a sign, as something that indicates the covenant that God has with him and that Abraham has with God. And it is to be circumcised uh, and so this applies to the male uh, offspring of Abraham and also to the male uh, servants within his household as well. Now, circumcision after Abraham continues on. Moses also is circumcised before the uh, Exodus and before the Sinai covenant. Israel, after the exodus from Egypt and before Sinai also is told by God to circumcise their male uh, children and men. And then after, at Sinai or after Sinai, it is also part of the legislation of the old covenant itself. And so circumcision played an important part before the old covenant because it was part of the Abrahamic covenant and then was kept by Abraham's descendants through Moses and then is and on with Israel, the people of Israel. But the old covenant at Sinai, it really established circumcision as a premier boundary marker. And then that perpetuated on through the, the centuries and millennia 
after that. The old covenant uh, with circumcision was that in order to be part of the old covenant, the covenant that Israel made with, uh, at Sinai with God, is that you had to be circumcised. It was a requirement. You, could, you couldn't be an uncircumcised Israelite and be in the covenant. However, the circumcision in the flesh, the physical circumcision, it in itself didn't bring about the reality of what it was supposed to signify, which was covenant membership. Meaning the sign of the covenant didn't actually produce a covenant member. It was to indicate you were a covenant member. And to be a covenant member meant that you were following the covenant. You were obeying the covenant stipulations. Circumcision in the flesh served as an external sign of what was to be an internal reality for the covenant member. And in this way, it functioned as a type of a different kind of circumcision that was to come in the future. And this circumcision that was to come, of which the physical circumcision was a type, actually was spoken of in the Old Covenant times. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, this is what it says, starting in verse 12. And now, Israel, what does Yahweh your God require of you but to fear Yahweh your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of Yahweh, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to Yahweh your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet Yahweh set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them. You above all peoples as you are this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. There is a metaphorical type of circumcision that's being referred to here. Not something that's done in the foreskin of the flesh, but the foreskin of the heart, something internal, something invisible. And I think this is an issue that the prophet Jeremiah raises as well because Israel was a stubborn people. And it says here, behold, the days are coming. So this is a futuristic outlook. The days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will punish all those who are, uns who are circumcised merely in the flesh. Egypt, Judah, oh, Judah, look at that. <laughs> the people of God. Edom, the sons of Ammon, Moab, and all who dwell in the desert, who cut the corners of their hairs. For all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in heart. So the issue was not just if you were circumcised in the flesh. Circumcision in the flesh was actually supposed to reflect the internal circumcision of the heart which was actually what was really the covenant was designed to do is to produce a community of people who lived in the right relationship with Yahweh, that they were obedient and humble and, and were uh, following all the decrees that Yahweh would give. And so right before entering the promised land, at the end of Deuteronomy, there's a prediction made for the future about this circumcision. In Deuteronomy 30, it says, and when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you and returned to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice and all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. He will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. This prophecy here is speaking of the future, about the way that Israel was going to 
uh, receive blessing and curse from the law for their disobedience. And then they would be scattered. But then in the, in the future, God would regather all of his people, Israel, and he will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring. So and the question then becomes, in this futuristic outlook from the old covenant perspective, is, well, should Christians be circumcised? If this, if this is the way God is seeing his people needing to be circumcised in the flesh and in the heart, then is circumcision still a boundary marker in the new covenant? To answer that, I'd like to turn to the letter to the Romans in chapter 2 where Paul handles the issue of what it means to be a Jew and what circumcision is all about. He says here in verse 25, for circumcision is indeed of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Basically, if you are not a law keeper, then it doesn't matter if you're circumcised. You're basically uncircumcised because circumcision in the flesh doesn't necessarily make someone circumcised in heart. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Won't he actually be exhibiting the circumcision that matters, the circumcision in the heart? Then he was physically uncircumcised but keeps the law, will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision, but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Circumcision for a Gentile, if the Gentile is submissive, is, if the Gentile lives in an obedient way to, to God, then he doesn't need to be circumcised because his life demonstrates the internal circumcision of, of the heart, which is what the Israelites and Jews, the descendants uh, of Judah, and uh, that they were supposed to exhibit as the covenant community in the old covenant. But the true circumcision is one that is inwardly, and it is something that is done, it's, uh, Paul says here, by the Spirit. This is going to be important when we talk about new covenant and the boundary markers for the new covenant. Because when we talked about the prophecies of the new covenant, one of the things that was spoken of was that God was going to put a new spirit in his people. And the prophecy we read from Deuteronomy chapter 30 is that God was going to circumcise the hearts of his people. He's going to give them a new heart. Let's look at another passage here in Philippians chapter 3. This deals with circumcision as well. It says, he write, Paul, writes, Paul writes here, Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. This is just another way of saying circumcision. For we are the circumcision, Paul says. Well, typically, Paul uses the term circumcision to refer to Jews, uh, to Israelites, as people who circumcise themselves in the flesh. But now here, now here he's reflecting it onto not just himself, for he is a circumcised Jew, but onto the people of God in the church, the believers in Christ, they are the circumcision, he is saying. We who worship by the Spirit of God, here the Spirit comes into play again as part of being circumcised, and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Let me read you one last passage to get a perspective about this. In him, Christ, this is Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, it says, in him, Christ, also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, non-physical. This is heart circumcision. This is surgery of the heart here. By putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So Paul is talking about 
as a new covenant believer in Christ that the older covenant circumcision in the flesh is not the way that the boundary marker is any longer in effect. Now, as the old covenant looked forward to the circumcision of the heart, that is truly what the circumcision in the flesh was pointing to. As a type in the Old Testament, it was to indicate something that was happening inside the person. But as we saw, there was plenty of failure on Israel's part to not live up to that standard. But Paul here is talking about new covenant believers that they have a circumcision by the Spirit in their heart. And that is the circumcision that matters. So as a boundary marker, physical circumcision is no longer part of identifying a person in the new covenant. Rather, it's the internal circumcision of the heart. The next boundary marker is food laws. Let's talk about food for a second. In the uh, Old Covenant, there were certain foods that were forbidden to eat. I'm going to list off a few here for you. You can't eat the fat of an ox, the fat of a sheep or a goat, and you couldn't eat the blood of animals. Uh, You couldn't eat any animals that did not have a divided hoof that was completely split and that chewed the cud. Um, So you couldn't eat camels, you couldn't eat rabbits or the hyraxes or pigs or or a number of other animals that maybe had a divided hoof but it wasn't completely split. Or maybe that they chewed the cud. For example, a rabbit is considered an animal that chews the cud but does not have a, a split hoof. You're not allowed to eat creatures without fins and scales in the water. You can't eat certain birds like an eagle, a buzzard, a vulture, a falcon, a raven, ostrich, owl, and there's a a whole list of them. You can't eat winged insects that walk on four legs. You can't eat dead animals. That kind of makes sense. You can't eat swarming animals like moles, mouses, lizards, and, and et cetera. There's other animals. You can't eat anything that swarms and crawls on its belly, walks on all fours, or has many feet. There's a whole bunch of of animals you're just not allowed to consume. So this this was given to God's people as part of a cultural boundary marker that when people would go to their marketplaces and they would look and, and they wouldn't see certain things for sale, it's because their, their community abstained from eating those things. It's kind of like if you would go to the grocery store and you would go to like the, uh, the section where they have the meat and you're looking for, I don't know, I'd say you're looking for chicken, but you're in a place where chickens are illegal. You can't, you can't grow, you can't sell chickens, no chickens. Well, there might be a name that becomes associated then with that particular town that doesn't sell chicken. You know, so if there's a, a place where you see something unique, oftentimes we label that. And so Israel here as a boundary marker has certain food restrictions and they're labeled as being kosher. It's a type of diet that they followed. So then we ask the question, well, should Christians observe these food laws? Are some foods prohibited for a Christian to eat? If that was an old covenant boundary marker, does it still remain in the new covenant? Looking back again in the letter to the Romans later on in chapter 14, it says here in verse 1, Paul writes, one person believes he may eat anything. It means there's, there are no restrictions on, on diet and meat that can be consumed, while the weak person eats only vegetables. So he's setting up here a a dichotomy between somebody who eats everything and somebody who is selective in what they eat. Here he uses the example of vegetables. He calls that person a weak person. Let not the one who eats, meaning eats everything, despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. 
but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed oops, clean. But it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good, to no, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats. Because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. So what Paul is trying to say here is that there are some people who do prefer particular diets. For example, if there is a Jew who embraces Christ as Lord and Savior, but yet wants to continue observing the traditions of his people by eating kosher, Paul says, that's all right. What's wrong is if you're a Christian and you know that there really isn't anything wrong with all the food that God has created and that you're free to eat of it, but yet you eat in a way that then causes your brother to stumble or for his conscience to be tainted by thinking that he is doing something wrong. That, Paul says, is not walking in love towards your fellow brother or sister. So he's establishing here that there, there is no food that is considered unclean any longer for the believer in Christ. But if somebody prefers to have particular dietary restrictions, then to let that weaker believer continue to eat what they want and for you to not then prohibit them or cause them a reason to stumble by what you eat. Paul also writes about this in Colossians chapter 2. He says in verse 16, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. These are, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. There's a big shift between the old covenant boundary markers and the new covenant boundary markers. And that is because the old covenant boundary markers were a shadow. They were a type. They were institutions that were implemented for a temporary time for the people of Israel. But now that Christ has come and has fulfilled the law, then those boundary markers are now changing. And there are new boundary markers for those who are in Christ. So let's look at the last boundary marker. The last boundary marker is the Sabbath. And this probably by far is the largest question of whether or not this old covenant boundary marker is still relevant for Christians today in the new covenant. Let's take a, a look at the Sabbath. Well, the Sabbath originated in the old covenant. There is no observance or commandment that is given to keep the Sabbath prior to Israel's exodus from Egypt. God instructed Israel to rest on the Sabbath prior to Sinai, prior to his covenant with them. And then at Sinai, the covenant became a regulation in the, co oh, sorry, the, the Sabbath became a regulation in the covenant at Sinai. There were certain pro activities that God prohibited his people to do on the Sabbath. You could not gather manna or you couldn't cook either 
You can't plow, you can't harvest, you can't gather wood, and you're not allowed to buy or sell things. So let's look back at the first time that the Sabbath is mentioned. This is coming out of Egypt with Israel before Sinai. Here in Exodus 16, it says, And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is what Yahweh has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Yahweh. Bake what you will, bake and boil what you will boil, and all that is left over lay aside to be kept till morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Yahweh. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your God. On it you shall, do, you shall not do any work, or you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So, when God brought Israel out of Egypt, he told them to to not work on the seventh day, to get them all the manna, all the food they needed, and to cook it and prepare it, and then to set it aside, and that it would not spoil. And so, the people did that, and they were like, whoa, it's still good. It It didn't stink, it's not rotting, there's no worms eating it. And that's because God said that they were supposed to rest. The Sabbath was to be a day of rest. And here in Exodus 20, when this is at Sinai, and the Sabbath is being instituted as an actual uh, legislation for the covenant, they, uh, uh, Moses here is explaining that it is, with, it is within creation itself that is, the Sabbath is being patterned after. So that the Lord God, Yahweh, made heaven and earth in six days, and rested on the seventh. And because of this pattern, then now the seventh day is to be holy, is to be set aside as a, as a day of rest, similar to the way that Yahweh rested. And they continue on. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor. Oops, I didn't push the button. <laughs> the penalty for breaking the Sabbath. <laughs> It actually changed between when Israel came out of Egypt and God first told them to rest on the Sabbath and after it became part of the legislation terms of the covenant. Before the covenant, the penalty for not observing the Sabbath was just a strict rebuke and a warning. They were, you were told to, don't forget to actually observe the Sabbath because there were people who went out, Israelites who went out and they gathered Man, they went out to gather manna on the Sabbath, but it wasn't there. And Moses had to remind them that you're not supposed to do that. But after the old covenant was ratified, now breaking the Sabbath had a severe consequence to it. That if you broke the Sabbath, you were to be put to death. And this, in fact, happened to somebody who uh, broke the Sabbath. Uh, they went to Moses and asked him what to do about it, and God told Moses that they were to stone the person for breaking the Sabbath. You can find that record in Numbers 15. The Sabbath has a connection, though, to the Exodus. I wanted to point this out. Deuteronomy chapter 5, it says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as Yahweh your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yahweh your God. On it you shall not do any work, or you or your son, or your daughter, or your male servant, or your female servant, or your ox, or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the sojourner who's within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, 
And Yahweh your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, so the reason then, because of that, Yahweh your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. There's some inextricable link between the way that God saved Israel as a people for himself and then commanded them to observe the Sabbath just as he had done in creation. Now let's move forward a little bit to, for example, the time of Jesus. Was the Sabbath still a boundary marker during the time of Jesus in the ministry of Jesus? Let's look at this record in the Gospels here in Matthew chapter 12. It says, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how, the Sabbath, how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He went on from there and entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So they might accuse him. He said to them, Which one of you has a sheep? If it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other one. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. On the Sabbath, Jesus and his disciples were walking around there and the disciples were picking some grain and rubbing it between their fingers so they could eat some food. And the Pharisees thought that they were breaking the Sabbath. But that's only because the Pharisees had an additional way to interpret what work meant on the Sabbath. And so here, Jesus and his disciples are not violating any covenant stipulation for the Sabbath. Actually, Jesus observed the Sabbath, and so did his disciples. They faithfully were, did not work on the Sabbath, and what they were doing was not breaking any law. But the Pharisees thought they were breaking the law because of the way that they interpreted the way to not work. And not working for the, on the Sabbath was things like you weren't allowed to write on the Sabbath. You weren't allowed to tear anything. You couldn't go shopping. You couldn't kindle a fire. You couldn't garden, do laundry. You couldn't even walk more than six feet in a public area. You couldn't even move anything with your hand. You couldn't pick up a broken bowl. You couldn't lift flowers in the vase. You couldn't pick up a rock that had fallen. It, there were so many things that the Pharisees considered work. And one of the things was harvesting grain to them. And they thought that Jesus' disciples were violating the Sabbath. But Jesus tells them that the Sabbath was not, that he is Lord of the Sabbath, and that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And that's why the next record, when he healed the man with the withered hand, he did that to demonstrate the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. But let me move on here to the question, which is, should Christians keep the Sabbath Paul also handles this in, this in the same section in Romans chapter 14. He says in verses 5 and 6, one person esteems one day as better than another. That's like making the Sabbath a holy day and the rest of the week regular. While another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day, a special day, like the Sabbath, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. This is all in the same context of the conscience of a person. And that if a person does dedicate a day to God, then they do so for the honor of God, that they are giving that day to God. 
But if a person uh, views every day alike, then that is also something that they do. They honor God in every day. And that each person must be fully convinced. So what Paul is doing here is he is saying that as a new covenant believer, there is no obligation to observe a single day. But if you do, then that is between you and God. And that you need to be fully convinced in your mind of how you're honoring the Lord. Paul also talks about the Sabbath in his letters. I'd like to read one scripture here from Colossians chapter 2. It says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow, which we spoke about earlier. The Sabbath was only an institution for Israel, but was a shadow of what was going to come. Now, what's going to come? Well, that's the question about, well, what is this deal with this promised Sabbath rest? In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9, it says, So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Well, that, that sounds like it's a new covenant Sabbath rest. So we're supposed to uh, still observe the Sabbath? Well, let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest, this is the rest that God promised, it still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. This is the author of Hebrews writing to his audience, and he's, he's going to be giving them a warning here. For the good news came to us just as to them, that he's referring to Israel. But the message they heard that Israel heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. The author of Hebrews is setting up that the rest that was promised, Israel failed because they were not united by faith. But the ones who believe enter that rest. As he has said, I, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. This is God speaking about disobedient Israel. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, from the time of creation in, in the, uh, Genesis chapter 1. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day, meaning the Sabbath, in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, so if Israel didn't enter it, but it still remains that some people can enter it, and those who formerly received the good news, Israel, they failed to enter the rest. This was referring to the promised land, which was a type of rest that pointed forward to the kingdom and the new creation. He appoint, Again, he appoints, oh sorry, they, he, they failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted. So what the author is saying is if David spoke of a arrest in his time, that was far after the time when Israel failed to enter the promised land because of their disobedience and they wandered around, around the wilderness. So David... Uh, later on, years and years and years later, talks about a rest that is still available today, then there must be some other Sabbath rest still coming. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua, the leader of Israel, had given them rest in the land of Canaan, God would not have spoken of another day later on where there would be another rest. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience as Israel exemplified. What the author of Hebrews is saying is that there was a rest promised to God's people in the old covenant. And they failed to achieve that rest. But then later on, David spoke of another rest. And that rest is being fulfilled in David's offspring, Christ, who brings about the new creation 
in him through the new covenant. And that in Christ, you can enter that rest. New covenant believers can enter that Sabbath rest now in a preemptory way. You could say an inaugural way. Just like the way that some part of the kingdom has come in the ministry and through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. But we do not see yet the fullness of the kingdom established. In the same way, the rest that God has promised for the future for his people is also, in a sense, available in Christ. In Christ even spoke about this in uh, Matthew chapter 11, in uh, verse 28. He talks about, uh, he, he tells people to come and to learn from him, to take his yoke for it's gentle and it's easy. And if you do that, he says, then you will, uh, you will find rest for your soul. There is rest available for the people of God. So that is the boundary markers of the Old Covenant. And in the next session, we're going to talk more specifically about the boundary markers in the New Covenant.